Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Manson. I'm the director of the Transnational Law Institute. I've joined King's in September of last year. And since uh, September, a lot of things have happened around the Institute. And one of the things that uh, is, I think, of great value is the way that it brings people together now. So today's inaugural Transnational Law Institute Signature Lecture, to which we've all been looking forward, will be given by a wonderful scholar about whom I want to say a few words, but not too many, because that's why she's here. I won't uh, take up too much room. But I want to highlight a few words about our speaker, because uh, if you look at the normal thing, which is a website or a CV, then you can see that there's a long string of achievements, and uh, these things sound as in the joke that was published in the New Yorker many years ago, where a doctor goes into a room, there's many little babies lying uh, <laughs> there, they're all newborn, and the doctor says to them, well, ladies and gentlemen, in October 2014, you will all pass the New York bar exam. So life, as we know, cannot be planned that way, except some parents try to do it. It unfolds in miraculous ways. But regardless of the way in which it unfolds, it takes a lot of work. That's another quote to a German comedian who says, art is very enjoyable, but it is a lot of work. So I think the way that Professor Annelies Ralph from Cornell um, does her work in both law and anthropology requires a lot of work, commitment, and if I say creativity, then the serious scholars will say, well, creativity sounds as if she's just enjoying this. <laughs> but it is involving creativity, because to make those kinds of connections that she does in her work, you actually have to think outside of the box. So she will speak today about a new frontier of uh, doing comparative work and actually proposing that we should go beyond comparative research. And she will call this a new scholarly and political form. So we will hear her speak about this, but before we do this, I want to draw your attention to something that she's done a little while ago, which was to edit a book on comparative law. The book, um, Rethinking the Masters of Comparative Law, came out in 2001, and it was published at a time when there was a great interest in comparative law, because people now remember that comparative law was born in 1900, in a very famous conference in Paris. And now, 100 years later, it, the time had come to reflect on where does this field go and what actually should, be, should we be doing with it. So from all these publications that came out, a lot of symposia and conferences, many of these publications just attested to the field not knowing really what it's doing. Is it a self-standing subject? Why is it so difficult now to defend that I want to teach comparative law in a law school? What is the purpose of that field? Because it's not a properly legal field a way of looking at the law in different places. So one diagnosis was that comparative law just deals with its own methodological anxieties all the time. Professor Annelies Ryle's book did something very different. It looked at um, traditions in comparative law that she said we should look at those in comparison. So she took comparative law traditions from different jurisdictions and said, let's try to understand a little more about the context, where these scholars come from, and how they have developed their project. And not just always do the typical Eurocentrist way of, can we, you know, as she said earlier today, get on a steamboat, collect some data, and come back and write it up. So that's one thing that I wanted to point out. So Professor Annelies Ralls is at the she's in the law school and at the Department of Anthropology. She's been traveling those two universes uh, very successfully, but most importantly, with a great deal of inspiration for scholars near and far. I looked today at her website to find something that I had, maybe I dreamt it, but I, I'm, I'm very sure that I saw this a few years ago, where either it was because you received an award, or there was a report about you and your office, and that if you want to see Professor Riles in her office, you always have to climb over the students that sit outside of the office <laughs> who are engaged in debates with her and in uh, learning adventures. So this is now no longer, I couldn't find this online, but it still is true. <laughs> so we are very pleased tonight to have you here, and we're looking forward to your talk. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much, Rolf.
Thank you so much, Pierre, it's, uh, that was a, m for that most interesting introduction, which was an interesting paper on comparative law in itself. And, uh, and thank you all for being here today. And, and, and uh, I just want to say, when Pierre invited me, I just said, of course, I would love to come no matter what, because uh, so many of us are so excited about what's going on here with the Transnational Law Institute and what this means for the Legal Academy more generally to have this, this, this uh, this focus and uh, and and also um, this focus in an institution where you have so many very very interesting scholars clustered together. You know, I, I said to Pierre today, you're in danger of becoming the next little Nirvana of legal studies, like Tel Aviv or so one of these places where we all dream. If only our institutions could be as cool as yours. So, um, so it's 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 really fun to be here, and I really look forward to the conversation. And also, this is a paper I haven't presented before, so. I really, um, I, I thought this is, of all the places I can imagine getting useful feedback, this would be the one. So I look forward to your comments. So, um, so the context for this paper, maybe to start there, is um, new configurations of markets and their scholarly implications, broadly conceived. So, and what I'm interested in is what's changing out there in the world um, and what can or should we, we scholars, we legal scholars, do with these developments? Um, maybe just to put my cards on the table, what is the critical or progressive scholarly agenda at this moment? What are its implications? What are the implications of all of these changes in, in, in economic forms for the academy? And what would be the value of scholarly interventions at this moment? And so I suppose th that's to say that I, um, we can debate this. I, my sense is that as someone who studies the financial markets up close, has been working in the financial markets for 10 years, I feel that something has changed. And, um, and one of the interesting aspects of this change seems to be that um, what we used to take as our scholarly project and the, some of the moves involved in that have been replicated and perhaps superseded in some ways by events in the world. And so let me just start with an example. Um, the collaborative economy, we hear about it all the time on the front pages of the FT and so on. It's uh, touted in management theory now as the big solution. So this is you know, the, the idea that you hear out there all the time that the new solution is the, so if, any, if any of you saw The Economist this week, uh, it's about the, the new labor economy in which people will be able to sell their labor in little bits to you know, whoever the highest bidder is, and we will all be freed from various constraints and be working together in new collaborative ways. So this idea that you know, whether it's teams out there building um, the latest gadget, working together online without even knowing each other, or consumers sharing reviews of those gadgets without knowing each other, or academics or artists somehow creating new work with, you know, across distances in, without the kinds of institutional or forms of organization we've been used to, that this is opening up new opportunities, social, economic, political, and so on. And <clears throat> of course, we often hear about this as a kind of breakdown of friction or barriers into new win-win scenarios. And the image of certainly the management studies literature is of happy, empowered people separated in space and time without the problems associated with social relations connecting them and somehow producing new forms of value together. Um, and uh, so here's a definition of collaboration from a presentation of a business school professor. So two or more people working together towards shared goals is what they think is what they mean by this term. And so if you think about that, people working towards shared goals, it's a very instrumental idea. So these are different people separated in different places, but what they share is a certain instrumental vision of what they're trying to do. And this idea has been also replicated very much in all of the cultural studies literatures about online communities and networks and so on. Um, that the idea of the uh, important paper um, by Fish and Al talks about how every such project, no matter how novel, no matter how diverse these are, has some concept of social or economic value, and that organizes all of these different people to work together and, 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 and and if we can just figure out what their notion of value is, we can understand and categorize these various new forms of online communities that are emerging and so forth. Now, what should we think about this? Of course, immediately, I think we all have all kinds of questions and queries and, and doubts. Here's two examples that, of course, have been in the news quite a bit lately um, for the legal and political and economic challenges that they raise, um, and technical as well. 
Um, so um, it won't be any surprise to anyone here that, that these projects, despite all the excitement around them, often seem to, to stumble quite a bit. And there's a whole other new field of consultants that have arisen to fix collaborative problems, the collaboration consultants who can make your collaboration work better. Um, so there's, there's that. Um, and then on the other side, even where it does work quite well, there are a lot of uh, questions being raised about whether collaboration, of course, covers up other kinds of differences or problems or hierarchies or what have you. So as two commentators in the Harvard Business Review uh, blog recently put it, in the corporate world, collaboration is at risk of simply becoming a new form of greenwashing. That sort of the way that you talk about whatever problems you have is to say, well, don't worry, we're, we've overcome it, we're collaborating in some way. Now, I think we could maybe put to one side for the moment whether collaboration is good or bad, which I don't think is the most interesting question. But just to think of it, you know, as I would as an anthropologist, as a phenomenon that seems to be in the water everywhere, um, and to ask ourselves, what is its emergence, this theme of collaboration as an institutional solution? Um, what does its emergence as a template for social or political or e even legal life N and also, of course, market activity tell us, and how should we, does it require any response from us as scholars? So what I'm going to do today quickly is uh, give you my own um, answers to those questions based on field work that I've been doing, as I said, in the financial markets over the last 10 years, but also based on my own engagement with the history and theory of two fields that are comparative law on the one hand and anthropology on the other. And then I'm going to talk about an example of a response to this that has occupied much of my time for the last three years. So first of all, to collaboration, what it is. So in the world of financial regulation, uh, you see, especially since the crisis, but in some cases certainly before, certainly in the EU um, long before, um, a a notion that the most in innovative policy solutions often take a particular form. They turn on some kind of collaboration, whether it's public-private partnerships or some sort of effort to harness the power of crowdsourcing or gathering harness the, the power of citizen participation through some sort of platform or peer review as a process. Um, some sort of idea that through some sort of collaborative venture we get better solutions than we do through, say, technocratic planning on the one hand or just market-based solutions on the other. Um, and of course, this is true in, the f in financial regulation, but it's true in lots of other areas. This was a thing that circulated quite a bit on the internet in the States. This idea that um, in the national security area also, the solution is <clears throat> to gather as much data as you can and sort of let the data kind of collaborate with itself, if you like, to figure out who's the terrorist and who's not, and, you know, sort of sort itself out in some way. And this whole question of, um, of collaboration as a sort of source of data, you know, whether you think of, um, say, all those apps that we use to get restaurant reviews or um, uh, uh, any of the other you know, ways in which collaboration is about gathering information seems to be part of a larger trend out there. If any of you are involved in the sciences um, in, as part of your research, um, you, you probably have touched on the, the problems associated with big data and the sort of idea of big data as the new solution. And, um, and it's interesting um, to uh, look a little bit at what computer, com computational science uh, find so exciting about big data as a solution. Um, because um, one of the, uh, the ideas seems to be here that data col can collaborate with itself. So um, here's, if you've heard of uh, this fourth research paradigm, this is an idea um, that's really hot now in computer science. And the idea is a long time ago, we had experimental science that was really old. Then we had theoretical science that was the next stage, computational science. And all of these were sort of advances on each other. But now we're at a say, stage at which you don't even need theory. You don't even need computations. What you need is just to put the data in a giant pool and let it interact with itself. And so we, the scientists, don't even have to come up with the hypotheses anymore. We just wait, and the data itself will generate the questions. Um, if there's enough of it stored somewhere. So the data, it's, so the collaborators are not even necessarily humans anymore. They can be non-human data forms. Now, I raise this, probably seems very far from law, but I raise this because um, 
you could see this as very hopeful, and this is presented by scientists often as really exciting, the new frontier. But in another sense, it's quite pessimistic, isn't it? I mean, it's an idea that we, the scientists, probably can't do as good a job as the data itself in figuring out what the reasons are, what the questions are even. So this delegation to the material itself of what used to be the human job, which was asking the questions. And I think that's interesting because when I look at um, collaboration in the regulatory field, it seems to me that it's often symptomatic of a loss of confidence. So if the big data issue is symptomatic of a loss of confidence in science and a sort of delegation to the data itself of the job of asking questions, which of course is the scientific project, then in the regulatory field, often um, it seems that when we don't know what to do, we say, let's collaborate. So if you're on the public side, you say, well, I bet a public-private partnership would solve this problem. Or if you're on the private side, vice versa, you try to get the government involved. This idea that somehow collaboration often se steps in to fill in um, a loss of, of confidence or faith in one's expertise of various forms. This is a picture, by the way, from, from Fukushima, Japan, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Um, so. Um, so the regulators that I worked with often looked to collaborative solutions when they l felt that they did not have confidence that um, they knew how to build institutions that would bolster a well-functioning market that could co co coordinate social activity through price. Um, so again, a kind of abdication of the task of planning, which used to be the role of the state in the market. <clears throat> and, and, by, and by the way, this is not just a problem on the public side. I think it's also true on the private side. If you think of um, when corporations uh, lose confidence in their own ability um, uh, to deliver a stable global production chain, for example, based on long-term labor relations, they often turn to crowdsourcing as a, quote, anti-crisis solution. So again, when you don't know how to do something, often collaboration seems to emerge as the solution. So the first thing I would just say about collaboration to summarize here is that um, it seems to be emerging at this moment of profound disquiet and doubt about our own forms of expertise um, around the market. Now, what does this have to do with legal scholarship? Well, um, I don't know about your institution, but collaboration is a hot word at mine. And you hear a lot about collaboration in the legal academy in a number of ways. The first um, is that we think of it as a legal skill that has to be imparted to lawyers. So you hear a lot of talk about the fact that lawyers don't know how to collaborate. That's one of the problems with lawyers. We have to train them to work together in teams, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a legal skill. Um, an another is that it seems to be a new methodology for research. So um, in legal studies, um, uh, you often uh, seem to think that legal t teams of researchers can do something more interesting or more exciting than people working alone in their offices. Um, or research institution, research grants seem to be more excited about, it's, it's easier to get funding for something that's collaborative than something that's not. Um, and then finally, collaboration, and I think most interesting and challengingly, um, is emerging substantively in scholarship as an answer to old legal problems. So. Um, there's a debate going on in property law right now where um, several scholars have justified certain doctrines in property law by the way in which they ena enable collaboration between different market actors, right? So reimagining particular legal doctrines as tools for collaboration. Now that's sort of interesting, you know, putting aside again whether we think this is good or bad, let's just put that on the shelf. Just as a phenomenon, the collaboration is a new buzzword. It's interesting because we used to have at least one other important buzzword, which was comparison. So um, as, uh, as Pierre said, you know, for a long time, um, comparison was a very, very legitimate, important scholarly project. If you said, I'm doing a comparative project, that was automatically understood. It was legitimate. It was important. Um, <clears throat> but you know, I heard someone say recently, um, uh, you know, you know, we were talking about the importance of hiring more comparative lawyers, and somebody said to me, who needs a scholarly comparison of UK and Indian law when a UK lawyer can just collaborate with an Indian lawyer on a project? So very much this idea that we don't need scholarly comparison anymore as long as we can build these collaborative teams that can do that work. So interesting idea that somehow the one displaces the other. Now let me just say clearly that I'm not suggesting that it actually does or it should. That's not, I'm just observing what seems to be a trend. And of course, 
collaboration does not actually obviate foreignness or the need to appreciate differences of many kinds. But it, what I'm suggesting is that it set, seems to obviate a kind of institutional interest or empathy for the foreign. And that also seems to um, coincide in many places of the world that I work in, which is East Asia in particular, but I think it's also true certainly in my own country in the United States, with an inward lookingness, um, more nationalistic orientation, a lack of empathy or, or, or interest in things foreign. Um, and, and, and that's, of course, not surprising because for many years the template, the project of comparison was really to understand the foreign, to ask philosophical questions about whether it was even possible to understand the foreign, how, how possible it was, to develop techniques or methods for translating ideas, um, or methodologies for studying foreignness, um, and, and, uh, and for explaining it, so discursive tools, legal techniques for making, for making foreign problems accessible within national legal institutions, and so on. Now, maybe what would be one interesting way of understanding collaboration, if what I've said so far is true, would be to go back and think about um, better what comparison was about as a form, and so that we understand what, what is being displaced here. So here's um, my take on what, how comparison worked, and you can certainly uh, contest this, or we can discuss it if, if I'd be interested in your thoughts on this. So my thought is that comparison was a really interesting set of moves because it involved at least three different impulses or three different uh, raison d'etre at the same time. So one um, was its claim to scholarly credentials. So comparison was a sophisticated project, legal science. And that was empowered by a certain connection to functionalist social science, especially functionalist anthropology. So the heyday of comparison in the 20th century was also the heyday of collaboration, actually, between anthropology and law as fields, but functionalist anthropology. And of course, functionalist anthropology has a particular, a and, and functionalist comparative law, had a particular idea about what data was and what analysis was. So there was this moment you know, we'll call it T1, when you were gathering your data, in the f maybe doing research, maybe going off to China or India, finding out about the other society or France or what have you, um, and you would gather the data and then, and, and, and that you would have particular relationships with particular people, maybe foreign lawyers, maybe, you know, social relationships with the foreign in T1. But then you would move to this T2 moment, you'd come back to your own office, come back to your own world, kind of forget about those people, that space, and now focus on your intellectual peers, you, not the others, but the people who like me. And in that space, you'd focus on conduct, constructing the text of comparative law w in conversation not with those people, the foreigners, but with a bunch of people who shared a theory with you, who shared a political agenda perhaps, who certainly shared a set of epistemological commitments, not with your research subjects. So these two separate moments are very important in the functionalist mindset. You kind of keep those things clear. If you don't, you're not a scientist. And um, just let me say as an aside, because it'll be relevant later, there was always a problem with this alliance between functionalism and anthrop in anthropology and functionalism in comparative law, actually. And the problem, ironically, was comparison. Because functionalist anthropologists, who had the same idea, T1 and T2 and all that, were deeply into context, 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 context. You know, you can't understand this, this, the law if you don't have a deep understanding of the social context in which the law emerges which means to compare the contract law of you know, Zimbabwe with contract law of London to, a compare to an anthropologist sounds absurd because it's losing so much context. And so the anthropologists always were quite critical of the comparative lawyers for not, not seeing scientific enough because they weren't contextual enough. Come back to that in a minute. All right, so one would be science. Um, but then there were two other aspects to this project, not just its scientific nature, but also its claim to some sort of professional cachet. So comparative lawyers were very, very uh, adamant about articulating an argument that comparative skill was crucial to being a good lawyer. So they wrote a lot of papers and gave a lot of speeches about how a good lawyer has to be able to compare, has to be able to compare across jurisdictions, has to be able to understand the foreignness of the client, has to do all of this and that somehow what comparative lawyers were doing was teaching an important set of legal skills. Um, and then finally, a third aspect of this, this 
three, threefold raison d'etre was an idea of, it, of comparative law as relevant to institutional projects of various kinds, whether it was colonization, decolonization, the building of international institutions, helping judges, law reform projects, what you have. The comparison was somehow very, very important to that. So not just a science. It's a science, but not just a science. It's also a skill, and it's also a policy tool. So, um, so for example, if you think of uh, a favorite legal pluralism, right? Legal pluralism was at once a serious scholarly project with ties to um, anthropology, a, a kind of ethical sensibility that practicing lawyers should know that things are pluralistic, and a methodology for colonial administration or decolonization, all at once. It had to be all three to really work. And I think one of the things we could say about why compar comparison as a tool has collapsed is that many, we wouldn't necessarily think of much comparative law as doing all three of those things at once anymore. Those who think of themselves as high scholars don't necessarily think that they're doing policy administration, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Now, one last thing about um, comparative law as it, as it used to work. Um, of course, these are broad generalizations that we can discuss. This is a picture of my, my hero, John Henry Wigmore. He was a real crazy guy, if you want to find a crazy comparative lawyer. Um, this, you know, as you can tell, see in there is Fiora. He doesn't look like, he's quite dash, you know, handsome. Uh, the, he was the dean at, at Northwestern Law School. Um, very, very adamant comparative lawyer. If you go to the basement of the Northwestern Law School, you'll find tomes and tomes of comparative law texts from every jurisdiction over the world. He was very close to <laughs> the elites of Chicago and used all their money to travel all summer long, gathering every possible <laughs> book from all around the world. And, um, and this was really the heady days of comparison. Um, it, but the interesting thing about someone like Wigmore, and the reason I bring him up is, you know, there was more to it for Wigmore than just um, science, professional training, and policy administration. This guy was having a very good time, right? And, and, the, and, and, and he wasn't the only one. I think there was a, a, something exciting about comparative law. It was a chic, fun, cool place to be. And, and, um, and, and there was a kind of intellectual community, a community of style, if you like, around comparative law. Um, and, um, and the project, if, if it was a political project, was not just about policy impact. It was also for people like him, and I've gone through his letters and documents very carefully, it was also about having a more elusive sense of impact, a sense that you changed people, that students came through your office or through your classrooms and they emerged as broader or somehow more interested in things that they were never interested in before, right, or wanting to travel or, uh, and so on. And that this was a project, an anti-parochialist project. It had a political dimension to it as well, as well as just being plain fun, right? And I think that's interesting because I said that there were three things, scholarship, uh, practical skill, and policy. But I think we could have another triumvirate, perhaps intellectual adventure, vocation, and political action was kind of in the background, not said explicitly, but very, very important. All right. So now, before we get too nostalgic about comparison, because I think I've made it sound great and so something we'd like to go back to, we might ask why comparison reigned really supreme in the, in the legal academy um, in the 20th century era of what we could broadly call, you know, following Foucault, the era of neoliberalism, right? A period, you know, we could talk about neoliberalisms, what have you, but a period in which the market was really um, supreme. And, um, and I think one of the things we could say is, if you look at the role of comparison in economic theory, you get part of an answer. Because um, uh, the, the idea, the dominant idea of, the neoliber of neoliberalism, of course, is that coordination happens through one key institution, which is price, right? But price does something very interesting. It basically sorts and compares. That's what it does. So, the market was the ideal means of human, institutional, mechanical, scientific, and national coordination. That's how things should be coordinated. But it needed certain building blocks of supports. This was the mainstream view. So it needed legal architecture, property rights, and all the rest of it, of course. But it also needed some concept, some stable concept of difference, right? You needed to know what to coordinate before you could even coordinate in the first place. And so something had to objectify or organize difference. And comparison was a scholarly project that fit into that at a very practical level, but also at a more sort of uh, amorphous intellectual level, the sort of legitimizing function of, uh, of the comparative project in the, in the academy uh, and the market. So 
So now let's talk about what's happened since then. So in the collaborative economy, how are things different? Um, well, one of the interesting things about the collaborative economy is that it emerges at a moment at which we've lost faith in the coordinative power of price. If we thought price could coordinate everything, we wouldn't need to collaborate in this way. We could just simply have a clear market like we did before. And we, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of the corporate turn to, to, to these forms of collaboration happens when one, when it precisely the point at which we've lost a, an ability to price in that way. Um, and, and also a sense that the market is no longer sustained entirely by the liber liberal legal institutions um, and all those social scientific paradigms I talked about before. So we have a different kind of epistemology emerging, a different uh, a, a, different, a different set of problems in the market, and, and I think that produces in turn a different scholarly um, agenda. Um, for the one, for first, there's less need for academics to compare in order to facilitate coordination since the starting point of collaboration is, uh, of co collaboration is not commensurable difference. It really doesn't matter anymore if you or I are different, what matters is that we share a common goal, which is to rate this restaurant or to figure out how to fix this law or what have you, and, and we're going to work on it together. So foreignness is sort of put by the sidelines. It's not a, it's not a problem. It's not something of fascination in the way that it used to be. Um, and the other thing, and maybe this is a little bit harder, is, um, is one important aspect of this is that it's enrolling citizens, it's enrolling everyone in the job of auto-interpretation. Just like data politics gets the data to do the interpretation, we all, as the, as the users of the cell phone app that, is, 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 is collab that collaborates on figuring out how to rank restaurants as opposed to ranking them through price, are both um, are, are doing the work ourselves. And so you no longer need the experts to do that work. And and so the interesting thing then is that what I mentioned before about T1 and T2, these different worlds, the world of the terrain of, of, the, uh, of what's out there to be described and the world of the analysis have sort of collapsed into one another. They're both being done, if you like, in the collaboration itself. So what I suggest in the paper is that um, in, a, in a collaborative economy in which there's a loss of faith in the coordinative power of price, and the market is no longer sustained entirely by liberal legal institutions and described with stable social scientific paradigms, um, a different kind of epistemology and a different kind of scholarly agenda ensues. Now, so here, uh, what I'm suggesting, here is one way of imagining and how, how thought and action within markets is shifting the terms of academic conversation. And I think this now leads to a, another question, which is, if collaboration is replacing comparison, what, is, what happens to critique? Um, and so, and how should we, how should we respond? Um, and, and one of the, and, 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 and one of the, are you, so, sorry, um, one of the, um, I think important things to keep in mind here when I said what's happened to critique is that critique also had a kind of T1, T2 aspect to it. You know, I critique them out there, right? The critique is direction to towards someone else. It's, it's somebody else is the problem and I have to critique them. But the interesting thing about collaboration is that we're all already doing it, right? And so it's very much part of our institutions, part of our world, part of our universities, it's part of the scholarly world. And so we're already kind of collaborators in both senses of that term. And so it makes the position of you know, normative outside critique, I think, very interestingly complicated. Um, um, and um, and, and I, as I think about this, I think there's really not much of an outside to this thing. Um, we now must find some way to do something within this template because we're already all, all inside it. So what I like to do then is try to find Another model, again, within collaboration, rather than try to get outside of it and attack it, which we might do something interesting with, since we're already, it's already so much a part of our world. And here, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how collaboration appears in anthropology and see if there's something we could borrow as lawyers from that. So this is a picture from the cover of um, Clifford and Marcus's famous book, Writing Culture, which I think most many, if lawyers have heard of one anthropology book, that's often one that they've heard of. 
Um, so this is probably a moment in anthropology that many of you are familiar with, the late 80s, early 90s, kind of crisis um, uh, of ethnographic authority in anthropology in which anthropologists start to ask, you know, we used to describe those people over there, but as if it was just empirically true, but there's this whole process of writing, that's why this cover is showing, the, turning the lens on the anthropologist, right, as opposed to the other and saying, what role does the anthropologist play in creating this story? Is it in some s sense fictional? Uh, also, is it, uh, what are the biases? What are the un untold hidden backstories behind these accounts? Um, and a big part of this was about recognizing that ethnographic work was always collaborative. It was always collaborative with the informant. The informant, I mean the word informant, right? Yeah, it's terrible, right? So that there was always a collaboration there but that got erased in this T1, T2 thing that I was talking about before, so that you just forgot about those people and wrote about your theory and the data and that they were left out. So that somehow that one needed a more collaborative vision of the ethnographic project itself. And this was a time at which all kinds of ideas emerged. Um, some of you may know Laura Nader at Berkeley, very important uh, legal anthropologist. She talked about studying up, uh, actually working with elites to write accounts of elite institutions. Um, uh, being one example. But the idea here, again, is just to bring these two pieces back together, to say that they, they both exist in the same time frame, in the same spatial frame, that the research and the analysis, the writing, these are all happening together and that collaboration somehow captures that. Now, in the last five years, collaboration has reemerged as really hot in anthropology, especially in the anthropology of science. Um, and you have a bunch of uh, efforts by anthropologists to collaborate with scientists, to produce new knowledge about science, or to copy scientists' own form of collaboration. Um, Chris Kelty's, interestingly, tried to look at how um, computer engineers produce Linux and see if you could produce anthropological texts in the same way that they produce Linux, that kind of thing. Um, and most of this is pretty much, I think, by people's own accounts, failed ter terribly and sometimes in really funny ways, too. But, um, but what's interesting about it um, is that it points to a problem, right? That the divide between these two worlds is totally implausible and we somehow need, especially when you're studying elites, whether it's scientists or lawyers, that you have to understand that you're somehow collaborating with these people already, that you're inside the project that you're trying to describe as if it was external. Um, so, um, and so that's one model we could think about, but I want to move to a more specific one that was also happening alongside everything I've described up to now, but was actually, I think, tendential and importantly different, um, which was what, was what happened in feminist anthropology beginning in the 70s through the 80s into the 90s. Um, because here we have a different genealogy for collaboration. So feminist anthropology started with a very basic an obvious but crucial uh, idea, which was that the motivation for scholarship was slightly different than functionalist anthropology. That the reason for scholarship um, was political solidarity with women in the world. Now we could have all kinds of problems with that. We can, you know, I'm not advocating again. Just like I'm not advocating collaboration. I'm not advocating this. I'm just describing. So this idea of um, women in political solidarity with other women and therefore wanting to be in some sort of conversational or some, some relationship with women elsewhere was an important, I think, motivation for feminist anthropologists. So they wanted to pay attention to the ethical and political and intellectual opportunities that inherit in these relationships in the field. And it was almost like what you write about it later is important but different. But what really matters is not describing these women. It's having relationships, having political relationships of solidarity. So the representational aspect was secondary. That was very different from the rest of anthropology. And it was why, by the way, mainstream, I was trained over at the London School of Economics across the street. And we were told that feminist anthropology was not anthropology because it was politics, right? It was not descriptive. It was a form of engagement. And I think that's interesting at this moment to remember this very, very simple idea because um, now we're back to a world in which collaboration is obviously central in many different respects as we've been talking about. And, um, and what if we regained this idea that the moment of the relationship itself maybe is more important even than whatever textual or descriptive or analytical work comes out of it afterwards. That, that was really the feminist political project. So 
what if, in our case, it might not be relations with women, it might be institutions, it might be, it might be professional, uh, professional connections, but that those relationships with, our, with the subjects, the actors who make law, might in itself be just as important as whatever we describe about the law. So that's just one idea I'll put out there, we'll come back to that. Um, now, um, this idea that feminists had actually created huge problems and really interesting challenges and debates. And, um, and uh, the, one of the problems was, how can you be both a feminist and an anthropologist in that mid-century functionalist terms that we talked about before. As I said, people over at the LSC said you can't. So, um, and, and remember that I said that um, there was a sticking point between, um, between comparative law and anthropology over this question of comparison. The anthropologists want to compare very, very contextually, and therefore big, grand comparisons are not possible. Well, there was the same exact tension between feminist anthropology, feminists, and anthropologists, because feminists, too, had this idea of comparison. They had this idea, remember, the status of women. You could talk about the status of women across different societies. And to an anthropologist, of course, that sounded absurd, because a woman in one place is not the same as in another place. You have to have much a much more contextual idea of what a woman is, just like you have to have a much more contextual idea of law. So, there's an interesting tension between the political project and the epistemological one for feminist anthropologists at that time. Um, and, um, and so, and I want to talk about um, how one very, very important feminist anthropologist, Marilyn Strathern, got out of, dealt with this tension because I think it's, it suggests an interesting idea for us for collaboration. So um, Marilyn Strathern uh, wrote this really fantastic, important book in 1988. Um, and, um, and, and what she did was she said, all right, I am a feminist and an anthropologist. As a feminist, I'm already inside this problematic term, this problematic term comparison, because I'm stuck as a feminist being somehow interested in cross-cultural women and solidarity across among women, even as I know as an anthropologist that that doesn't make any sense if that makes sense to you. Um, so she said, what can I do? Well, what I could do, rather than denounce feminists or denounce anthropologists, which I can't, because I'm already both of those, what I will do is I will treat this problematic turn, in her case, comparison, as what she said is a convenient and controlled fiction, an as if. And she said, um, you know, this is a fiction that allows me to do certain other things. So I'll just say, of course I know that you can't talk about the status of women, but I'll go about it in an as-if way, as a fiction. And of course, as a lawyer, this is incredibly inspiring to me because I think that we lawyers are, are, are ace in the hole. What we do better than anyone is fiction. We know how to play legal fictions. You know, it will be deemed that Tuesday is Friday. It will be deemed that this contract existed. It will be, de you know, we're so good at convenient and controlled fictions. And, um, and so, um, and, and in, in fact, I would go so far as to say it's what most legal, legal technique is about. So, all right, so. Fast forward to our present moment. Our problematic term, of course, for today is not comparison, but collaboration. And as I said, just like for Strathern, we're already inside this thing. We can't get out of it. It's all in the water everywhere where we are, in our institutions, in our scholarly world, in the market. What do we do? Um, and, and, and I would say there are two key insights from feminist anthropology about what you could do. The first, as I said, to repeat is that the output of our scholarship might not be as important as the relationships that produce it. That would be one idea. Um, the stuff in the world, the institutions, might be more important than the text or the analysis that we produce. That's, of course, hugely problematic. We get tenured not for what relationships we have, but what scholarly outputs we produce. Um, and then the second would be to treat this problematic turn collaboration as some sort of fiction. So what does that mean? You know, we're gonna do it, but in an as if way, all right? So what does this look like in practice? Let me give you an example. I'm finishing, don't worry. Um, so so um, I was in Japan in 2011 um, doing field research at the time of the earthquake. Remember, we had the triple disaster of March 11th. Uh, massive earthquake uh, followed by uh, 
a tsunami that of a magnitude which hadn't been seen in hundreds of years and then followed by a nuclear disaster. And, and if anyone has lived through um, any one of those kinds of incidents, whether it's in Chile or elsewhere, you know how destabilizing they are on every level. The question of personal safety, the question of, um, you know, of, of all the way up to, you know, of, of, of uh, you know, the philosophical questions. What do I do with, you know, why am I here sort of questions. And then uh, questions of authority or responsibility. Why didn't I see this coming? Um, what could I have done to prevent it, and so on. And, and as someone who was working with legal experts in various fields, I saw people go through tremendous um, moments of destabilization in terms of their own sense of their expertise. And, you know, so lawyers asking, why did we never question that the, our legal institutions to ask why they were set up in such a way that companies had incentives not to prepare for disasters? Or scientists saying, you know, why did we not realize that there was a kind of a nuclear industry a village that reinforced its own, own, own assumptions and never made room for other paradigms that might have predicted this or saw this coming. Um, or, um, uh, and, 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 and when I say this was destabilizing, um, I mean really destabilizing. I've had people uh, talk about, um, you know, ending their lives. I mean, you know, people really uh, thinking, you know, what is, the, what is the purpose anymore and why everything that I thought I believed no longer makes sense in quite the same way. And one of the interesting pieces of this that began to merge in conversations was a sense of linguistic or disciplinary or professional um, geographies that, that limit, that separated people. So scientists being separated from lawyers, academics being out of touch with ordinary people, people in different uh, nations that were affected by this not understanding one another, even though, you know, this problem of, you know, uh, how, what, do we, what do we do with the fact that the technology comes from uh, from the United States, that it's funded, um, you know, in, in yet another place, that it's built in Japan, that the pollution is spreading to Korea, and yet there's really no space in which to have a collaboration across those borders. And so we started just very quietly, actually just um, talking over email as a way of keeping people engaged and not, um, you know, and, and not totally despairing, and eventually turned into something a little bit more formal. We organized ourselves um, as a project called Meridian 180. If you know Meri Meridian 180 is the, is the opposite Meridian to the Greenwich Mean Time Meridian. It's the anti-Meridian, the sense of the place of the opposite, but it's also the international dateline that separates East from West. Um, and um, we, we decided to start having uh, private, entirely private conversations among experts of various kinds, government people, academics, anthropologists, um, uh, lawyers, professional lawyers, uh, and, and a smattering of everybody else from, you know, a postmodern theologian to some artists, I mean, all kinds of people who were thinking about what is the condition of our moment, really what in, in various practical ways, talking about specific difficult topics. And I should say one of the important things here, which I'd be very interested in talking about, but it relates to the problem of comparison, is that we insisted that all conversation happen in at least four languages, so everything was translated as a way of really allowing people to uh, try to bring in perspectives which the hegemony of English sometimes keeps out of the picture. Um, and now we, ha this continues now, we have about 700 members, but we keep try to keep it really um, small and as small as we can and, and um, uh, you know, keep the idea of a, of, of a, of a small community um, working together. We have some meetings as much as our money allows and then otherwise we, have these online discussions a lot of the time. And here's a give you some sense of the kinds of topics we've discussed. The red is were live conferences and the black is online conferences. And what's interesting about these, these conversations is that they're very different from what you see on the web, I think. Um, they're really very, very serious and detailed and substantive, difficult to follow. They take a lot of time. People spend, spend an enormous amount of time thinking about what they want to say and writing these various posts. Um, and it, it's interesting to ask, why do they do it? Because there's nothing in it. You certainly don't get any points from your, if you're an academic for spending time on this kind of thing. No one can even see it. It's not public. Um, um, we act, we, 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 we 
put very little out in public at all. We don't have a Twitter account. We don't let journalists in. I mean, we really try to keep it as private as we can. Um, and then, um, and so, um, so, so, here, so here's a kind of project which, um, which you could say in some ways fits comfortably with the new collaborative economy in the sense that it seems to be about bringing a bunch of people together to do something which used to be done by scholarship, right? Replacing comparison with collaboration in some way. Um, and it also seems to fit with the collaborative economy in the, in the sense that rather than having a set of subjects of study like professional lawyers, we now have brought those people into the process of the work itself that they're sort of auto-analyzing themselves, if you like, inside this project. Um, and so you could definitely read this project as collaboration in the greenwashing sense. I mean, I think that would be a legitimate description, and we could, I'd like to talk about that. Um, and I would not disavow that, because just as Strathern, I think, could not disavow her commitment to feminist politics, even though she thought it was problematic in all kinds of ways, I don't think any of us can disavow our involvement in collaborative missions at this point. I think we're too far down. That, that train has already left the station. Um, but I think you could also see it um, as collaboration in the sense of feminist anthropology's first innovation, a sort of valuing the relationships more than the outputs. One of the interesting things about this project is that we don't have any explicit outputs so far. I mean, we're talking about producing some books and other things, but we're really not, that comes quite secondary. What we really want is just to have the relationships and the conversations. So that's one aspect. Um, now, um, now, and, and furthermore, I think um, that if you, if you think that on one hand this could be embraced by a university as a new exciting collaborative thing, you know, showing how universities are becoming so exciting and collaborative, there's also something really weird about this. And I experience this all the time when I have to explain to my dean or to donors what the heck this group is about. You know, well, we don't really have any purpose and we don't produce any uh, documents and um, we don't really... Uh, have any clear outputs? How does that sound to you, right? So, um, and 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 this I think is a really interesting aspect of it that we have no common purpose to which we are all contributing our expertise. So it's not like the restaurant app in the sense that the restaurant app knows that it's about figuring out which is the best restaurant. This is about a bunch of people who all have doubts about their own skills coming together and talking about what their doubts are. And although we have a whole range of projects, some kooky and um, utopian and some totally impossible, some more practical from, you know, remaking rule of law indicators to um, creating a common currency for Asia, I mean, you know, all kinds of things. Um, I would say those are kind of as if projects, right? So they're kind of fictions. They're things we're working on along the way, but they're not the real motivation for what we're really trying to do here. Now that's absurd in the management consultancy language, because in the management consultancy language, collaboration must be about reaching some well-defined purpose. Everybody's got to understand what they're doing, and if they don't understand their relationship to the outcome, it's a bad collaboration, as UC Berkeley management professor Morton Hansen has put it. And so I think ours is a very, very bad collaboration indeed. Um, so what are we doing? We're acting as if we're seriously collaborating towards some end. You've got this whole group of interesting experts acting as if they're collaborating, um, uh, towards some end, whether it's consulting or producing policy reports or what have you, while knowing that we're not, we really wouldn't, we're not really doing that. So it's a kind of impossibility, a real contradiction, a total mess. And I think that messiness is, has a kind of feminist uh, method to the madness in the sense that the, the idea of the collaboration itself is a kind of um, controlled fiction. So if, so I want to suggest to you today that this is actually a serious project. This is a serious scholarly and political project, even though I know that you're thinking, she's totally mad, this does not look like it. This does not look like what, compar what replaces comparison, there's no way. So let me just offer you one final thought, and then I'll stop, which is, if it's serious, we must have learned something. So what have we learned? Um, and... So one of the things that we've learned, we've learned many things um, in the course of our experiment, but one of the things that we've learned is how difficult it is to sustain a group of p experts' interests over a long period of time. Uh, that we have to be continually rekindling and recreating our own interest in each other, in our project, in our work. That it's not, self, it's not a self-perpetuating thing. We have a lot of exhausted 
and overcommitted um, professionals and intellectuals who have to be constantly made interested again in, their, in one another, in their connections to one another. And one of the things that we've been thinking a lot about is how do people get excited? And of course, that was an old comparative law problem. How do you get people excited in the foreign, right? How do I get somebody in Chicago really interested in the details of what's going on in China and really interested in paying attention to what a colleague in China is, is actually interested in when that makes no sense in the American mentality, a classic exa example of this, we, had a f we, uh, we uh, asked our Chinese colleagues to suggest a forum topic, and they came back very excited. They said, the topic should be happiness. Probably had some thoughts on this. And the topic should be happiness. And I thought, happiness? You're joking, right? We're going to talk about happiness? And they said, it's got to be happy. Happiness is the most important thing we want to talk about. So I said, well, this is part of the project. We have to rely. If that's what you want to do, we'll talk about happiness. And they debated, what is the meaning of happiness? And, and of course, there was a whole political subtext to this, which Eva knows, which was that there was a party document that had come out that had suggested that the new purpose of the state should be to promote happiness. And so it became an interesting way to talk about what the state was doing, is to ask whether or not it's actually producing happiness or what are the elements of happiness, or does happiness require civil and political rights, and so on. But that is fascinating. But the problem was that Americans just thought, oh, it's a form of unhappiness. I think I'll tune out now because that's stupid and weird, right? So how do you get people interested? And I think that was always the project of comparative law. The, the subversive project was to create that kind of interest. And if this seems absurd to you, then think about any collaborations that you're actually involved in right now. And think about why, if they've petered out, they've petered out. And in most of the time, I would guess, it's not because of lack of money. It's not because of lack of time. It's because people just lose interest in it for one reason or another. And the question of how interest is actually produced turns out to be a quite serious one. So, um, so, uh, so I think that um, one of the ways of thinking about what might be the deeper connection to the tradition of comparative law is what are the ways in which we rekindle interest in the foreign and the strange and the uninteresting and is that in itself a kind of political project for our time? And that there might be spaces in which to do that which have nothing to do with producing articles in law journals and yet require very, very serious intellectual work and a kind of connections between professionals and scholars which the legal academy has always been uniquely able to produce. And so I will stop there. So. Thank you very much. So Professor Riles has generously agreed to, uh, to hang around a little more so we can engage in the discussion. And it's already late in the day, but we left the windows open, so for me at least it's chilly and <laughs> I want us to engage. But when you do, please, you have to speak up so that your angelic voices be registered. And to the degree that that might not be entirely possible, if you were so generous to just maybe Repeat. two or three keywords say this question I understand it addresses. That great. would be fantastic. Great. Wonderful. Got it. Thank you. And I, I don't need to moderate, right? No, no, no. It's great. Hi. Yes. Great. Thank you. Uh, you know, so much to think about in this paper. Um, the, the question that struck me is this, this push for relational research would be very strong in the work that I do, definitely in transitional justice. It's getting pushed as an idea of doing ethical research. Right. You know, it's about building relationships, maintaining relationships. But now I want to tease out one of the tensions in this because the relational research you discuss in feminist theory is about has a has a political is about political solidarity. In a post-conflict context, building political solidarity can you have to positions you in relation to a conflict and mm -hmm. actually can undermine the maintenance of relationships. So for example, if I working in post-genocide Rwanda, it is crucial to me that I manage to maintain relationships across socioeconomic divides and across ethnic divides, because mm. those are the things that I, that, that the divides are where the conflict is coming from. And so to the project that, you're, that you've spoken about, I would be really interested in how are you dealing with, how are you accommodating conflict within this, within this forum of trying to build relational collaborative research? Great question. So the question, as I understand it, is is, um, is there a tension between 
does relational, does building relationships entail taking sides in some way, or making commitments that in turn undermine the very project the relational idea was about, right? Um, yeah, and actually, I think that that's basically why the feminist project also fell apart, right? I mean, the idea of solidarity with women seems kind of kooky now, doesn't it? I mean, you know, like, sorry, but, you know, which women? And aren't they in tension with each other? And, you know, so, so I think that was, that was what happened. That, that, I think that you just pointed something that's fundamental to this. Um, I, I guess, so I guess I would think of that, too, as a kind of as if, in the sense it's impossibility, having those that solidarity is impossible. And yet, the positive side of the feminist project was to strive for something knowing that it's impossible, right? And, and, and I think that was always the interesting part about feminism. It doesn't fall apart even as you know that it's totally impossible and kooky, right? You still remain committed in some sense. So, um, so that's what I would take from that. Now, how do we accommodate conflict in practice? Um, you know, I, I'm still struggling with this. Um, uh, I, I, the idea originally was to have a lot of very hard-hitting, direct conflict. And of course, but then I realized that that itself is a very American idea of fantasy, right? That we're actually gonna fight with each other and fight it all out with words, right? That's just so, so what do you do with your very idea of conflict is quite culturally bound, right? And I think we've been kind of having to face an exploration of what are different genres for, in, for accommodating difference across different linguistic and professional fields as well, right? The bureaucrats in the group are exquisitely careful in hiding, detailing, not hiding, but framing their conflicts in ways that you have to, it's like three-dimensional chess. What is this person really saying, right? Oh, actually, he's attacking the other guy, but I wouldn't, you know, we academics come out and say it, right? So, so, so all that is, is, is very interesting. But I think also we found that sometimes the divisions that you expect to be there are not, and that's also, you know, I think an old feminist insight that there may be points of solidarity that you don't expect. One of the ones that comes to mind was we had a, we, somewhat, somebody in our group suggested that we were too, our membership was too skewed to the left, which isn't that surprising, right? That uh, on the whole, the group of people that we had were too, so that we should have some diversity. So we should bring out a real right wing. All right. So we went and we found this guy who was perfect. He's a top American securities guy, chief legal officer for the Republicans from the Budget Committee of the Senate. He has a PhD in East Asian Studies. He claims to be a Zen monk. He was also an admiral in the Navy. I mean, just, he's just, I can't believe it, right? He speaks Chinese, right? And this guy joins, and he starts attacking our Chinese colleagues, right, in, in this group. So he starts saying, you know, all these people in this group, I just want you to know they're all on the payroll of the party, and they're all a bunch of hacks, and I don't even know why we're having these discussions. It's pointless. These people are all just a bunch of frauds, you know? And I thought, my God, what are we going to do? And it was a crisis for me. I was like, oh, oh hey, you know, how are we going to deal with this? And how should we stop this guy? Should I censor him? And of course, he loved it when I called him up and said, I'm not going to post your thing. And he said, why not, Miss Liberal? What's the problem with you? You know, I thought this was a bad discussion. You know, it's just, he was just skewering me. So we, I thought, what to do? So finally, we let this post go. And our Chinese colleagues were just amazing. They wrote back and they said, well, most of what he says is actually totally true. So, you know, it was so interesting that it didn't bother them. And I said to one of them, I said, well, I said, well what, what, what's your reaction to this? He said, well, it's kind of like pornography on the internet. You see it all the time, but don't, after a while, you don't even notice. <laughs> and I thought, so where the conflict is may not be where you think it is. So that was the point of that story. Yeah. I just wanted to introduce another, another trend in the UK. Yes. This, this move towards collaboration, which is that uh, I don't myself do social science research, but I was on a joint, I was on a steering group for a joint project on two main research councils, Law for Hunter and the Humanities, which is where the kind of right. oh, sits. But then we have something called the Economic Defense Council, ESRC, where the right. social science stuff falls. So I had to sit and see these grants. And nowadays, you would be hard pushed to get one of the large grants, I noticed. Absolutely. Unless you have what you're calling the informant, very deeply involved in the project in some way, right? So on, the, on your steering committee, you have to have someone like representing the community, etc. You then have to have within your plan some way of presenting your outputs to them, involving them, 
in that T2 moment, I'd add a T3 moment, mm -hmm. where after you produce your initial report, there is now, or you'd be quite hard pressed to get the grant nowadays unless you've got a T3 moment <laughs> that involves the informant. And it's really yeah. easy to get cynical about it, but I've seen such good examples of that working. And the most wonderful example was an anthropologist in Cardiff who did a five year longitudinal study of attitudes of toddlers. So he was interviewing, I don't know, three, sort of seven year olds and eight year olds. And his T3 bit, which is involving the performances, had a wonderful party for them and the parents and brought them in and kind of, you know, talked about the research to them. And, and it sounds really cheesy, but it worked brilliantly, mm. actually. So, so in the UK, the collaboration bit, and this could also be a part of the relationship bit, that has become an absolutely key thing of the informants aren't just involved at the T1 stage and at the T2 stage, we need a T3 stage, which is actively involving them as collaborators in, in a slightly more equal relationship. Right, and I really I don't think it's like America. I, same, absolutely, and and I think that, and as you say, it is easy to be cynical, but how that comes out is unpredictable yeah. at at the outset. Whether we should be for it or against it simply can't be said as as, as a priori, right? Yeah, and to give you a negative yes. example of that, a friend of mine sort of does research on kind of issues of race and right. communities in the UK, really big longitudinal studies and is required to involve people. Actually, she used to be here working on, um, she worked with Penny Green, who was here, working on issues of domestic violence in ethnic minority communities in, in the North. And so she involved them, kind of, you know, as collaborators to talk to them. It was a nightmare, because they really tried to <laughs> censor her, you know, in terms of what she wanted to say back to them about issues of domestic violence and ethnicity and things. So there's these risks as well about collaboration that informs, you know, informs Right. I mean, the one thing I think I would say as an anthropologist is that we've always had these problems, right? We've always been censored and self-censored in all kinds of ways in practice. I mean, there are practicalities that, of course, when there are vastly unequal power relations between the anthropologist and the informant, then that's, there's less of that. But in a situation in which you, there, that, in a world in which that's changing, there, were, there was already all kinds of trouble around this. So it's not... It's not an entirely, I don't want to overstate the way in which we're in an entirely new world. There's, there's also continuities there. Thank you. So I was very interested in uh, your point about uh, collaboration challenging our notion of outputs in the, in the academy and how we judge our outputs and what's the there there in terms of uh, the results of your collaboration, and especially when you Thing in terms of um, writing and publication. And then you were describing your project and you talked about a post from that uh, mm -hmm. securities guy. Um, and so clearly you had internal posts. Um, and you know, if done well, that's certainly an output of sorts because it requires a lot of thought, a lot of attention, yes. and um, it is a, a venue for your ideas. Mm -hmm. And so that leads me to, to wonder about blogs, which as you know, mm -hmm. is, you know, way a lot of academics are going in terms of getting their ideas out to the biggest audience. And so my question is, do you see blogs as a, um, as a way that can uh, further collaboration and as a mechanism that can promote collaboration, or do you see them really as the T1, T2 dynamic that you described earlier? It's just an, an electronic version of T1, T2. Um, Great question. So the question is, are blogs an example of of the hopeful dimensions of collaboration, or are they really just a, a, a return to the old way of doing things? Is that right? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I guess I would, I, I think we should be open to, you know, there are different kinds of blogs and different purposes. I mean, for our group, we felt that a blog was not what we wanted because, not so much because, because there's a lot of posturing on the internet. And there's a lot of self-promotion, and the blogging is often about describing yourself as you'd like the world to see you, as opposed to <laughs> thinking hard about what your weaknesses are and asking questions about matters in which you're really not confident and sure. We wanted a space, you know, I mean, I think most, many of our participants have lots of blogging opportunities elsewhere in which they sound like they've got it all figured out, right? But this is a space in which they sort of say, oh my god, you know, my field just cannot deal with this or that, or 
I used to believe this, but now I'm not sure anymore, and what do others think about that? And I think part of our problem with that securities guy, actually, was that not that he insulted the Chinese, it was that he violated that norm, that one should actually be quite, it's a space in which to be quite self-reflective about whether or not one has it right. And that that would be kind of the analog to the old comparative law, was a self-reflective piece. Um, yeah, and, and that is the interesting thing, is that the, the writing being done by the members is so careful. And you know, I would say it must take three or four hours for people to produce these posts. And why are they doing something for which they get nothing in return? I think that's kind of interesting, just as a phenomenon. But then we all went into academy to do things that we thought were just of value for itself. So maybe having no purpose is a way to recuperate that. I should say one more thing about blogs is that um, some of our members have actually profited quite well from sort of, yeah, so one of our, one of our uh, members is a, um, a managing director at a big um, financial firm, one of the big three financial firms. And he <laughs> followed a discussion about new models of finance, the anthropology of finance, and so on. And he said, oh, great. So he turned this into a blog post, advertised it as a seminar, and, and, and you know, made his clients really happy and I'm sure made tons of money off this. And we thought, great, that's fine. Like, everyone can exploit this as they wish. They just can't um, directly quote what other people have done. And so I, the idea is it's also kind of commons in that respect in the way that perhaps a blog claims to be a commons, but is actually quite authorial in the way it says it was actually my idea. So, and I'm not sure we have, it, so I suppose I would just say, that I think this is connected to the problem of the commons in the academy and what are we gonna do about um, the production of intellectual knowledge that can't be attributed or that is collectively owned in some way. Thanks. Yeah. That was a very, uh, Ben Bowling from the Law School of Kings. Uh, an immensely stimulating uh, presentation and um, very, very interesting in lots of different dimensions. Uh, but uh, an, an observation and a, and, and a question. The observation is that um, there's some quite interesting work in sort of policy analysis mm -hmm. on the purpose and outcomes of collaboration and coordination. And there's someone called Martin Rain or Ryan, emeritus um, at MIT, who wrote a book called From Policy to Practice. Mm -hmm. And in there, there's a chapter called The Plea for Coordination of Services, which is um, a very interesting uh, book chapter. And essentially what he shows is that um, a program, I think it's called the Four C's program, to try and coordinate services for children in the US in the 1960s, ran for a decade. And at the end of the decade, there was no evidence that any services for children had become more closely coordinated. <coughs> and he explains why that is, because the plea for coordination of services comes from very many different kinds of uh, justifications and rationales. So, for example, the desire to reduce overlap and uh, the desire to maximize coverage conflict with one another and it leads to a policy impasse. And so, basically, his argument is that the justification for collaboration could simply be that collaboration is a good thing. Whether or not it achieves something good is actually a secondary, a secondary issue. Mm. And as you see this in many, many spheres, that there's actually very little in fact, the game from collaboration in my area is criminology, you see some crime prevention, massive uh, calls for collaboration, crime prevention, really no evidence that it actually produces anything. And actually the failure to produce anything out of collaboration actually is a justification for a call for more collaboration. <laughs> right. Right. The more it fails, the more it's designed. So um, I was intrigued by um, a project which sort of explicitly produces nothing in terms of outputs, because maybe it's the process of working together, which is actually the, the important thing, even if it doesn't, in a sense, produce anything tangible other than stronger relationships. So I thought that seems to be a parallel with what you were saying to some extent. Um, but the other point, really, that's central to your paper is that um, collaboration has, is replacing comparison. And yet, it seemed to me that some of what you were saying was that collaboration is a route to comparison. So rather than the charismatic, um, um, behatted gentleman right. <laughs> traveling the world, right. comparing things, right. now more rooted people perhaps 
um, communicate with their colleagues who are doing the same kind of work or similar kinds of work or work on similar topics elsewhere. And rather than trying to produce some sort of synthesis, that actually what's required is bringing the various materials on similar topics together and seeing what you've got. Um, I did a project on stop and search or stop and frisk, an, an edited collection, which was supposed to be a kind of comparative project. But it didn't ever, we never really got to the point of comparison. <laughs> because once we'd assembled all the papers from Japan and from Canada and from Australia and the USA, actually what was being talked under this rubric was so fundamentally different in many ways. There were some common themes, but actually the basis for the comparison, the, um, the adventuring anthropological comparativist, probably would have come up with something quite different. And what we ended up doing was simply assembling the papers and saying, here you are. Here is a collaboration which could, in a sense, be the basis for comparison, but almost didn't need to be. It's almost another route towards comparative work without really calling itself comparative. So that was just totally gorgeous, let me just say. <laughs> that was incredible. Wow, that is so fascinating. So let me just ask you a question. So this Martin Ryan, um, is the idea that justification for collaboration is collaboration as good as a normative matter, even if it has no instrumental purposes? He's a skeptic and, and basically says that, well, it's, it's often about resolving other kinds of problems, fiscal crisis, um, but more often it's simply like motherhood and apple pie, this must be the, the best thing to do. We can't, we need to do more with less, so rather than kind of agonizing about that or doing what we do better, let's collaborate. Right. So it's a slightly different kind of idea because it's about how do you do more with less in public services. So he's really saying we need to approach the call for the plea for coordination of services skeptically and think about why the motives for it may clash and that it may have nothing to do with producing good outcomes at all. Right. That's really interesting because I think Everyone involved in this project thinks collaboration is pretty much nonsense, right? That it, it, for all these reasons, it doesn't produce anything. That this is a, it's, a, it's a sort of an impossible venture. And, and, and so what I hear you saying is Martin Ryan had a quite you know, smirky view of this. But in your project, the very failed comparison is interesting in and of itself in some way, right? The, the comparison, or it's a sort of a, what is it? A, 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 it, there's a hopefulness to it in the sense that it's on a path to something, even if... Is that right? I think so, yes. So I would say that the... I mean, it was nice because we got everybody together in the same room right. and we shared right. papers. And there were some very clear common themes like marginalisation of ethnic minorities, the use of power, and so on. But it kind of... The collaboratively bringing together examples of something similar in different places, right, seemed mean. actually to be fine just as it was. And a short intro and a short conclusion was all that was required. Maybe that you could go on to do something more comparative, but simply bringing the material together had done something a bit like comparison, but wasn't comparative in the traditional sense of the word. Because one of the things that I think is interesting, again, to contrast the kind of project you're describing with this, is that your project is quite um, self-consciously <coughs> modest, right? So it, you're not with a fedora sitting up here saying, look at me, like I'm, you know, I'm the hero who travels the world. The way to get interested is to first be interested in me as a phenomenon or as a, as a, a subject identity and then to emulate me, right? That was kind of what these guys were about. Whereas your project is way more modest than that. You kind of disappear altogether. In fact, you don't even have an analytical frame to the whole thing. And it's, and it's, this seems ridiculous. Like, we can't go around with fedoras. No, right? That's not going to work. So, so we have to find some other way of generating that kind of, um, that political commitment after it seems impossible, but also that interest after this, this authorial identity is no longer an option for us. Um, but it sounds so small, right? I mean, I'm sure you have, in my experience of what you described, have done similar things. And people say, but is that all? Is that all you can do, right? And so it, I think it takes a lot of courage to say, yes, actually, this is it. This is where we stop. Right? It's very cool. Thank you. Okay.
take one more question. Sure. It's, okay. well, uh, it's very interesting, and uh, I'd like to follow up on, uh, on this point precisely, mm -hmm. because the conclusion is uh, or deals with the, how do we generate interest mm -hmm. in compilation. Although, well, I'm missing the why uh, do we have to be interested in comparison. And actually, when you ask this question, at least uh, as far as I'm concerned, when you ask the why question, you realize that uh, well, comparison is the highest form of knowledge. Uh, if you go back to the original understanding of a comparison, and perhaps even the etymological understanding of comparison means uh, taking things together in order to understand better both things. And so, in a way, I don't think that uh, well, the authorial type of comparison or uh, even uh, Ben's uh, example of comparison are not yet quite there. In fact, uh, as Ben pointed out, uh, it's uh, a route towards uh, real knowledge. Uh, so I just wanted to, to know whether you agree with this uh, and uh, whether your what, why, sort of uh, as a place or uh, is it just. Uh, so, uh, so I think it's, I would add one little quibble here. I don't think it's about generating interest in comparison. I think it's about generating interest in what one is not interested in, which for me is another way of saying the other, right? The other is what one doesn't give a damn about, actually, right? One just, you know, take, you know, whatever the hell is going on over in China, whatever debates they're having, they're just not interesting to me, right? Or, um, you know, so th that attitude, right? That, that, that's a very American attitude. No, 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 of course, but, uh, but I think we all have things that we just think of as whatever. It's not of concern to me. And I think the larger project of cosmopolitanization was about not totally changing that, but just broadening people as much as you can, a little bit at a time. And I think that's actually, that's a political project I'm still committed to. Um, now, whether comparison is the highest form of knowledge or not, I don't know, you know, I mean, I think other societies, as an anthropologist, have, other societies have other ways of doing stuff with the foreign, right? It could be through particular kinds of symbolic, you know, symbolizing it, or, or creating certain kinds of symbolic inversions, or, you know, there are other ways of doing things. I think comparison is a very important one. It's not uniquely Euro-American, but it's certainly strong in Euro-American tradition. Um, so, but yeah, so I just wanted to say, I, I think, what we're recuperating here is not necessarily the comparative project in the grand scheme as much as it is the, the, the question of how one confronts a kind of inward lookingness, which I think we see in a lot of, a lot of societies and a lot of disciplines right now. So. Great. Thank you so very well, much. Thank you. It's really helpful. Thank you.